Howdy friends, today we come to one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it is filled with so many interesting things that are difficult to explain. And I kind of like that. I like it from several standpoints. Um, I like it from the standpoint of, if you know, if, if we can figure out everything about God, if he's a God that can be confined to the intellect of even all of humanity, then he's not bigger than all of humanity. So I love it in scripture when we run up on something where God is just being a lot bigger than us. And it's also one of my favorite chapters because it just shows a very fallible guy uh, in the hand of a very good God. It's also one of my favorite scriptures because it deals with the failures and successes of a guy, not just one or the other. Because I think, honestly, most of our, most everyone who has ever lived um, is full of failures and successes. Life is not just one or the other. And I think a lot of times we don't know how to handle our successes and we don't know how to handle our failures. And so when I meet people in the scriptures who God is dealing with um, and we see how they are positively or negatively, godly or not godly, handling their failures and successes, then it becomes instructive to me. But finally, why this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, because it deals with the sovereignty of God beyond the musings and mechanics of man. In other words, it's um, there's this old Chinese proverb that says, you know, you can't stop the bird from flying in the air. Um well, you, you know, you can with a shotgun or a bow and arrow or whatever, but you can't get all of them. You can't stop birds from flying in the air, but you can stop them from building a nest in your head. And uh, that's an old pagan proverb, but it tells a big truth. You know, there's some things you can control. And there's some things you can't. Me being an old drunk, I'm very much, um, you know, been sober since March 2nd, 1997. I'm very much familiar with um, that prayer, Lord, help me today to control the things I can and let go of the things I can't give me the wisdom to know the difference. Um, amen. And uh, I think a lot of times, and especially in our culture, we, we get to thinking that man can do more than man can do. And uh, this is one of these chapters that reminds me that it's very wise to do what you can do, but it's even wiser to trust God with the things you can't do. So let's have a word of prayer and <clears throat> um, coming out of a flu fog and uh, don't know if I'm all the way out of it, the fog part of it, but I'm going to be struggling with my voice today, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you to excuse me when I cough or have to pause to catch my breath or if you see me need to drink some water today, I'm just going to beg your pardon. <clears throat> As you can tell, still struggling to have wind and clarity here, so beg your forgiveness. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, as we open your word today, there is definitely more here than can be adequately or fully handled in the time we have allotted. So, Father, I pray that this sparks curiosity among those who participate in this video Bible study to go and dig deeper and research themselves and to think through these things, to see the the sovereign doctrine, the the uh, of, you know the the doctrine of of your unchanging, unchallenged power, and to also see the 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 doctrine of man's right and wrong ways of doing what what's in their hands to do. And um, more than anything, Lord, draw us close to yourself. Call us into holiness. Call us into usefulness. And, uh, and then unleash us wherever we stand to be useful for your glory in this world. In Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, so this is one of these pretty long things that I'm going to break up into bits. But there's two bits of it that no matter how much I break it up, it's still a pretty long read. So let's just get started. Got four big ideas today. Um... And really, you could put them in two. There's two big ideas. You know, um, Gilead deals with um, <laughs> the Ammonites, uh, and then Gilead, Gilead deals with, uh, I mean, Jephthah. Jephthah deals with the Ammonites, and then Jephthah 
deals with his the consequences of his vow. But I think inside of the first one, we got three sections, and then the, and then the second one, there's a, there's a mirroring section. So let's look at it. Let's begin with Judges chapter eleven, verses one through three. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, or Tob, either one's okay. The worthless, excuse me, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Okay, so here's the story. Um, uh, his dad produced a son with a prostitute. That's a tough beginning. That's what I call Jeff, Jephthah's difficult background. His difficult background comes in three parts. How he was born, how his family responded to it, and how he f responded to his family's response. All right? So... <clears throat> No matter how you slice it, the Bible says what it says. Jephthah is being raised up as a judge of Israel, and he was not only a prostitute son, but a rejected brother, and he's also seemingly the best we can tell. He, um, When it says in verse 3 that he, he had some uh, worthless fellows who went out with him, that, that, that means he was in a band of criminals, or you might say he was in a gang. So, uh, big, big implication number one, um, where someone comes from, how someone has been treated, and even where someone is, does not always preclude them from being used of God. Now, that's very encouraging to me, because I've had a rough black ground myself. I don't think, you know, definitely wasn't born in the circumstance that Jephthah was, but I chose to go out with a rough band of fellows myself a few times. Um, and then what's God do? You know, God saves me by a sovereign hand, and then God calls me to the ministry. Surprise, surprise. I'm still the most surprised person of all. January 4th marked uh, 22 years in that call, and I'm still very surprised. Anyway, I think that's a powerful, it's a powerful story here. But I think to understand how powerful that story is, okay, you got to back up and remember that nobody's good here. They're, they're spelling out Jephthah's life, but no one is good here. The people keep deserting God. Back up and look at uh, Judges chapter 10, verse 14. Look what it says. You know, God tells them, go and cry to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you. Now, in other words, everybody had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody. Um, not everybody's story is being spelled out in detail. Same is true today. Some people's stories get spelled out in detail, and we say that that detail is worse than this detail. In other words, that person's a worse person than this person. But the point is, everybody has sinned and fallen short in the glory of God. Go back and look at Genesis chapter 6. Nobody was listening to God. Everybody what was doing was doing right in, what, what was right in their own sight, by their own judgments. What's God do? God gives favor to Noah, okay? So this is not that Jephthah is more worthy, and it's not that Jephthah is any better or worse than anybody else. It's God. God is going to do something. He's got to raise up somebody, and everyone is a sinner, so he raises up this sinner. Now, I told you to go back and look at 10, 14. You know, God said, all, you know, all, cry out to these gods you've been worshiping. You walked away from me, cry out to them. But look at verse 16. Uh, verse 16 is uh, uh, really important. Um, uh, it says, uh, so they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. And I love that. He became impatient. In other words, there, there was no one being a deliverer among them, even though they were beginning to turn away from pagan, uh, uh, you know, idolatry and putting away these other gods and turning to the Lord. No, there was still there was no one who was worthy. So what's God got to do? God's got to raise somebody up. It's always true. It's always true. And so you get this. You get Jephthah, and you know, no doubt, 
Jephthah's born the son of a prostitute. His, as his other brothers grow up, they said, no, man, we're not sharing our inheritance with this cat. Um, you know, read that how you want to, but I'll tell you what it means. It's, it's competition among sinners. And, you know, many people might look at this and say, man, look what it did. You know, them mistreating Jephthah drove him out into a life of crime. Well, that's the human explanation. Also, Jephthah's own choices drove him out. So they put him out, and then <clears throat> Jephthah joined in with, with, with people that he, you know, he, he should not have joined, um, um, joined in with. But there's something more here. Now, you know, you might see these uh, uh, as a as a band of criminals, and I, I I think this is one thing that a lot of you know uh, average rural white Americans don't understand about inner city street gangs. It is very likely Jephthah's group was doing some crime or shady stuff. Um, they don't spell it out in detail, but it's very likely. Okay. Just like, you know, name these gangs in big cities. But it's also very likely that they're practicing protection over some some villages and some families. You know, think about the Italian mafia. They're doing some bad, but, you know, in another way, they're protecting their own. I'm not excusing their bad. I'm just saying this concept is neither only new or only ancient, okay? Jephthah is a, I mean, he's a, he's a blood. He's a crip. He's folk. He's, you know, he's La Cosa Nostra. Ridiculous metaphors, but you get the point. Now, now, where do where do you get that? I, I'll tell you where I get it. He's in a band of guys, and when they when uh, when Israel starts to get threatened by the Ammonites, they call out on these guys. In other words, they have a reputation of being tough guys. They have a reputation of being warriors. Okay, and so there's that dual reputation of. They've been cast out of society, but they've gained some strength and power and and uh, influence, you know, in the in the same process. All right, so that's what man is doing, and, and it doesn't say, you know, it doesn't say it's right. It's just telling you the story. So there's Jephthah's difficult background. I see time is flying. I love this story though, you know, I love it. All right, so so then the next part of the story gets, you know, kind of kind of interesting here. Um, Let's read uh, 4 through 11. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. Okay, here we go with these characters. Verse 5, And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob, or Tob. Either one's okay. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. Now here's your proof that they've seen him to be a mighty warrior with his, his band. Verse 7, but Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come uh, to me now when you're in distress? Here's where old Jephthah starting to sound like the Lord. Israelites cry to the Lord and the Lord tells him, Judges 10, 14, hey, go cry out to the people you've been crying out to. Why? It's, it's pretty interesting little parallel there. Uh, the, uh, Judges 11, 8. And the elders of Gilead said uh, to uh, Jephthah, that, that is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be a witness, will, will witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader. Head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. All right, so he's reconciled with the people who had rejected him. This is a beautiful story too. Reconciled with the people who had rejected him. And let's look at this in, in, in two little parts here, okay? First, these elders, these elders of Gilead, they they recruit, they call on, they request Jephthah to come to him, okay? And uh, uh, and they, you know, Bible history tells us that uh, um, they come from uh, Abraham's kinfolk, Lot, 
So they're really descendants a lot. You know, that was a nut anyway. Go read that story. That 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 story about Lot and his daughters and just that whole thing is crazy. Genesis 19. Okay. Um I think I think it would be easy to see an illustration here. It has long been the habit of broken humanity to only ask for help this way, right? When either we're lazy or in distress. It's long been the habit of man to only ask for help this way when we're lazy or in distress. When either we won't or can't do something ourselves, okay? Um, I think this is a case of both. They fear these Ammonites, okay? So they reach out to uh, Jephthah because whatever Jephthah's been doing, he has proven to them, as far as they can see, he ain't scared. <laughs> or as those little, those little stickers I see in the back of some truck windows, I, you know, I ain't scared. Jephthah's not scared, you know? And so then he responds to them, you know, and there's a little jockeying in the middle of, 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 of this. They put a presentation out, and he goes, hey, man, you, you, you kicked me out. Why are you coming to me now? He's like, well, that's why we're coming to you now. You know, they're basically saying, you know, we should have never kicked you out. You know, sorry, come back. Then he says to him, all right, if you want me to come back and fight, and when the fighting's done, in other words, if the Lord gives the victory, the Lord is also giving me uh, leadership over you after that. That's the deal. He said, I, you can't have me just to fight. You got to have me and keep me. Now, who in the world knows what's in their mind, the Gileadites' mind, the uh, Gileadites mind, minds? Who knows what's in their minds? Um, did they did they think, well, maybe he'll give us a victory and get killed in the process and we won't have to deal with him? Or, you know, fine, we just got to get through this tough time, whatever, and then we'll deal with him later. Who knows, right? But here's what we clearly see. We clearly see, okay? We clearly see that they say yes to the deal. They say yes to the deal so much so that they go and, you uh, know, in, in sort of a worship official setting. It's sort of where the, the civil and the spiritual meet, right? They, they, they go and they have a ceremony and agree to make him the leader and the head. He is the, the general and the president. You know, um, he, he's the king and the prime minister. Just trying to give illustrations, okay? And they go to do it in Mizpah, okay? Um, which means watch. I always think that's interesting. Whatever's done at Mizpah, watch. Um, and this is where the... The, the deal was made between Laban and Jacob, Genesis 31. We won't, I won't chase that rabbit as much as I want to. But it's the same place um, um, that that deal was done. Now, why do I think Mizpah is so important? Mizpah means watch. And, and go back down to verse 11 and watch this, okay? Watch this. <laughs> so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all of these words before the Lord and watch. Okay. And what are you saying is, I think, I honestly think it's twofold. We're going to do this here. So he's saying the Lord is watching us make this deal. And if you do wrong, it is the Lord who will punish you. And I think they're also saying, we're going to do this deal here and watch to see what the Lord does. Is the Lord in this thing? Will the Lord give us a victory over the Ammonites? Okay, we're really going to have to fly. I just saw the time. This is such an exciting thing. And I think it's the symbolism is intentional by God. They go to Mitzvah. Watch. The Lord's going to watch over our doings. Whew. I don't know, man. I, I get a little excited in a, you know, sort of a fun, excited way. And I get a little trembly both when I think about that. The Lord's going to watch over this thing. Whew. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, we're going to watch to see what the Lord is doing. Whew. 
Okay, because the Lord's always doing something. We're not always watching. Sometimes even when we are watching, God doesn't reveal it all to us. This is, you know, this is big stuff. Oh, my goodness. I, I have only done, how many? 11 verses. I've got to do like 29 more. What am I doing? All right. Now, this next section, let me say up front what I find very interesting here. Uh, and, and, and is is that Jephthah, Jephthah uses politics in this next section. He uses politics, but more importantly, has faith. You want to look at where a lot of these so-called Christian politicians uh, uh, get off rails? It's because a lot of them just use politics. They don't really have faith. Okay? All right. This is kind of a long section, but let's let's just tackle it. Let's just do it. Judges 11, um, 12, and I think I'm going to stop at, what is it, 28? Yeah, 28. 12 through 28. <coughs> Excuse me again. Sorry. <clears throat> Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah. All right, and he says this, Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now restore it peacefully. Peaceably. Verse 14. See, they politic him. Jephthah says, what y'all doing? The Ammonite says, well, when y'all left Egypt, which is like 300 years ago at this point, y'all took stuff from us and we want it back. And we're just saying, we're just saying, get, give it back. All right, verse 14. Jephthah again sent messages to the king of the Ammonites and said to him, thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. But when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this. The king of Edom, they're the descendants of Esau. And here are some descendants of Jacob. These brothers are still disagreeing. Um... All right, where was I at? Oh, man, this is such exciting stuff. All right. Verse 17. Israel then sent messages to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, but he would, he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. All right. Pause. We'll come back to verse 18. Uh, Jeff, Jeph to... Uh, sends people to the king of Ammonites says, what are y'all doing? The king of Ammonites says, y'all took this stuff from us when y'all came up out of Egypt and we wore our stuff back. He said, oh, 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 wait a minute. We stopped at Kadesh and we asked to pass through. All right, let's make sure we understand the history. He continues. So, so we, we just stopped at Kadesh. We didn't have, we did not have permission to go through y'all's land, so we didn't. All right. Uh, but as uh the guy used to say on the radio, wait, there's more. Okay. Then they journeyed, verse 18, then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered up all his people together and encamped at Jaash and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited the country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Chemosh your God gives you to possess? And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, will we will possess. 
Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and in Aroer and its villages and in the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon 300 years, why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. All right. Did you guys see how exciting that was? He gives him a threefold case. He says, we didn't take anything from you until you, you know, it's like, don't start none, won't be none. Well, you started it. We asked for permission. It's 300 years ago. We asked for permission to pass through. You said, no, we didn't pass through. And we, Edom and, 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 and Moab said the same thing. So we went around them. We wasn't even, you know, wasn't even bothering them or y'all. But, you know, we went through, you know, Arnon, Ararat. You guys started this mess. And then, then what seemed to be only a battle between uh, governments and politics and people groups, you see who was really behind it. God gave us the land. All right. So they said, watch your mouth, bro. Watch your mouth. Because God has given us this. All right. Y'all got a God. His name is Chemosh. Y'all call out to Chemosh. See if Chemosh will give y'all some stuff. Threefold argument. Okay. He says, uh, we didn't start it. You did. We wanted peace. You didn't. We see that God gave us this. And if you're going to take it back, you're going to, that's, who, that's who's going to give it to you. All right. If, if y'all can get y'all's God to whoop our God, good luck. Now, see, beyond, he looked at history and he looked at the moment. It's both what he might be able to accomplish with peaceful politics and also what God was doing in cosmic warfare. Cosmic sovereign control. I think we miss that element in a lot of our, our our dealings, brothers and sisters. He tries to negotiate with the guy. He tells the guy the plain facts, but you know, verse twenty nine sums that up really well. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Okay, bro, I'm trying to tell you all this makes sense. It, it wasn't you know God might have used the Israelites to dispossess the Ammonites. But it was God who dispossessed the Ammonites. And if God has dispossessed you and given possessions to us, then we understand that if we get in some kind of conflict here and God dispossesses us, it'll be God who does it. Or if God continues to dispossess y'all, it'll be God who does it. Now, here's where a little history comes in. If you, if you, you, know, if you do a little history of the moment, um, in those 300 years, okay, now I'm going to give you the short version of this. I see time flying. In those 300 years, Ammon 300 years ago had been on the wane, but since then they had they had they had been on on the rise, and and uh, historically speaking, they had they had taken over Moab, um, and they weren't trying to pass through. They they had taken territory that you know had not been theirs. <coughs> Excuse me, and now they wanted some old territory back. You, know, you saw you see some of this stuff going on right now the 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 you know the nation of Russia said they historically owned the Crimea so they're going back from something they historically owned and they've taken it back from Ukraine and for some years now two armies have been sitting on the borders one is uh way more powerful than the other and um and um you know just look it up. It's I mean this stuff goes on all the time. All right. All right. So there we got we got ten minutes here to do still a bunch of scripture, but it's really good. There's the story. I, I want you guys to see it. They're trying diplomacy. They're using politics. They're ready for war, but they understand God is the sovereign decider in history. And in history. Back back. And what's what's going on right now. And that's how, for all his faults, whatever, God is raising this guy up. God is developing this guy, Jephthah. 
of all his faults, you see that he does not see this only through the lens of muscle and sinew. He sees that God ultimately is in control. I don't think we see that sometimes. I think we, you know, we worry that, how do I say this? We worry that we have to win. Take any church business meeting, man. People worry they have to win, okay? What what you can do is do what you can do. You know, you can't you can't control the bird flying in the air, but you can keep them building a, a nest in your head. You know, I, I like that Chinese proverb. I don't even know where. Oh, I know. I got it from um, a commentary by David Jackman some time ago, um, and I've been using it ever since. I don't I, uh, I don't know if he attributed the original source, but it was a Chinese proverb. I remember that. You know, can't can't control the birds in the air, but I can stop them building a nest in my head. I can't stop you from doing X and Y. Right, but I can I can do something, okay. Um, more importantly, you can do what you can do, but God's really in control, and so uh, I, I I I fully believe. Sir Edmund Burke said uh, the only thing that it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. At the same time, at the same time, if we go to doing stuff, you know, in an ungodly way, we're not. We're not going to overwhelm God's divine plan, but we're going to get out of fellowship with God's divine purpose, per person. Let me say that again. If, like, you know, if, 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 if we go to politicking and warring in ungodly ways for ungodly reasons based out of our pride, the, the foolishness of man will not overwhelm the divine plan of God. But in man's foolishness, he may miss fellowship with the divine person of God. All right. So this last part, because, oh my goodness, look at the time. Okay. This last part is so cool and so sad and so tragic and so interesting. <clears throat> spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Here's this fourth thing. Um, God is giving the victory. You're going to see it. This is, you're going to see it in just a moment. God has given the victory to Jephthah, and then Jephthah makes a rash vow and then keeps it. It's really interesting. All right. Judges chapter 11, verse 29. Sorry for all the sounds. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. There's that Mizpah again. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites, all right? Now, what's unwritten right here is he's gathering troops. That's, that's, that's the unwritten part of the story. As he's passing through, passing through, he's getting his army together, all right? Verse 30, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Controversial translation alert. Okay, we're going to come back and look at verse 31. They want to make a note. I don't know if you highlight or pencil mark things in your Bible, but uh, underline uh, a burnt offering right there. Okay, verse 32. Um, so Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. And the Lord, the Lord gave them into his hand. Said no, then they 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 doing the fight. See, the Bible doesn't avoid the foolishness and faithlessness of man, right? But the real story is always the faithfulness of God. Okay, all right. Verse thirty-three. <coughs> Excuse me. And he struck them from Arrowhead to the neighborhood of Minith, twenty cities. And as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home in Mizpah. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. 
for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity and my I and my companions. Uh, all right, now if you write in your Bible and take notes, draw a line from weep for my virginity all the way back up there to, um, to verse uh, uh, 31. Oh my goodness, verse 31, a burnt offering. So draw a line from weep for my virginity all the way back up to uh, a burnt offering. Okay. Okay. So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months and she departed. She and her companions and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughter of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. Ooh, okay, so two things, two things. Uh, God gives them a, a victory. God gives them victory. Somebody say amen. Uh, don't don't miss out on this. It's the Lord who gives the victory, and that's all we're going to say about that. All right, then he makes this vow. What in the world were you thinking, boy? What were you thinking? He makes this vow. Whatever comes out of, the, out of my house, I'll, I'll, I'll offer it up as a burnt offering. Okay. Time out. Go back to that. Oh, gosh, time is flying. Help me, Jesus. All right. So you you got to pick a you got to pick a translation lane here and go with it. If you look at the ancient Hebrew grammar, it could be OK. Um, it could be translated whatever. Or it could be translated, whoever comes out. Whatever comes out or whoever comes out. Um, and then I will sacrifice it. Remember I told you to underline in verse 31, a burnt offering, okay? Uh, it could, you know, you could, look at that verse. You could say, then whoever or then whatever. It's interesting here in the English Standard Version, they say, then whatever comes from the doors of my house. Uh uh, I will offer it up as a burnt offering. I will offer it up as a burnt offering. All right. You could translate it just like this. This is my paraphrase, but I think it's a it's a valid one. You could translate this. Whatever comes out of my house, I will offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord. I will offer it. Whatever, whoever. You can do both. Whatever slash whoever comes out of my door, I will offer it as a sacrifice to the Lord. Okay? So, human sacrifice, Leviticus 18, 21, Deuteronomy 12, 31, human sacrifice is directly forbidden in scriptures. So, does he kill his daughter or not? Well, there, there's room to believe that he he does. There's also mega room to believe he doesn't. But what he does is to sacrifice his daughter means to consecrate her for religious duty so that she never knows a man. There's no possibility of grandchildren. There's no possibility of her uh, having the joys of family herself. Right? And I, that's why I said draw a line, weep for my virginity. If she's going to be killed, <clears throat> she won't have to and she might weep that she's never had a husband, never known a man. But that won't be something that continues. But if she's consecrated to the Lord, never takes a man, never has a husband. Which to take a man in those days meant to have a husband. The biblical definition, one man, one woman in the story. That's. I believe that what happens is he's saying, it's like this. Whatever comes out the door. If one of the goats runs out the door, we're going we're gonna to offer that sucker up on the altar and burn him as a sweet incense unto the Lord. Whoever comes out the door, I will, I will consecrate them as an offering to God. 
and uh, I'll lose their servant. So let's say some servant or, uh, you know, now they're gone to serve the Lord. They don't have to work for me ever again. I don't think he counted on the whoever to be his daughter. If there was a whatever, you know, it's going to cost him something. Would a, would a bull walk out of the house? Would, and, yeah, trust me, that was possible. I see we're going to go a couple minutes over. Just, just forgive me. Oh, you can always hit stop. <laughs> um, if it's a whatever it's going to cost him, if it's a whoever it's going to cost him, I don't think when he made that rash vow, I don't think he ever thought that the whoever could be his wife or his daughter, his only daughter, his only child. And I think what she mourns is that she sees it. She'll never, you know, she'll never have a family. And, you know, if, if, uh, if Jephthah's out here being abandoned and stuff, he's already breaking a lot of the other laws. I'm just saying, their custom, their their their, their lawful custom would have already been their lawful custom. It's a custom because it's their law. The law made it a custom, is that you do not do human sacrifice. Okay, um, okay, um, so and here's an important point that he accurately reviews a 300 year old history to the king of Ammon shows the man knows the word he knows the word he knows the history from the Torah so I, I believe I believe what he what he's mourning is that his his daughter's going to be out of his household so out of his fellowship on a regular basis it doesn't mean he ever never sees her again she's not going to have a children he's not going to have the joy of her fellowship not going to have She's not going to have the joy of a family, and they're not going to have the joy of her children. That's what I believe. Now, let's get to this rash vow-making deal. Now, you know, guys, we, we went through we went through Ecclesiastes. You'll remember in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, basically verses 1 through 6, it speaks very plainly about the danger of making foolish vows there. Shouldn't make foolish vows, Okay. Now, wouldn't it have been better if he'd have just said, "Man, God, I I made a dumb vow here. I better back up and re rethink about this. I was an idiot, Lord. I was rash. I was unthinking. I was foolish in the moment. Maybe I'm not foolish all the time, but that was foolish. And Lord, I want to repent. I don't. But he doesn't. So on the one hand, I'm like, it's like Charles Spurgeon said. On the one hand, um, this is a uh, you know a rash vow is always better to be broken and kept you know a foolish rash vow on the other hand you kind of admire the man for for sticking to what he said he's going to do and i'm right there i see the tension on the one i'm like no nah, you ain't getting my daughter I, I can't do that i i was i was wrong right there but on the other hand well i made i gave my word uh you know uh, I, I i wish a lot of christians would understand what it's like to give your word to be a follower of jesus and and uh you know, what he says in this case is, I've given my word and I cannot take back my vow. Verse 35, Lord have mercy. If we would see the word we've given to the Lord and live as people who don't take it back. So he fulfills his vow. And there's so much here. It's, oh man, let me just throw my notes away. Look how much time I went on. This is such a rich chapter and I didn't even, I didn't even unfold everything. Either way, I pray that, uh, you know, as we just looked over, you know, some of this that you are spurred to look over more. We'll uh, we'll look over a little bit more of Jephthah's life next week in chapter 12. And we'll also meet um, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. How come nobody ever names their kids after these guys? Anyway, thank you guys for listening. Peace.